Hello and welcome to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Today we have part one of a multi-part series where I'm having a conversation with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos, uh, the authors of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. And so this series is basically Kai and Leo taking myself and my Patreon supporters on a journey from start to finish how they would teach a student about Stoicism. And I couldn't have picked, uh, you know, two better people to start a series like this with because, uh, man, their collective knowledge and uh, and wisdom on this uh, when it comes to this ancient philosophy is uh, really uh, something to behold. So in this first episode, we focused on the dichotomy of control, of course, one of the major principles that we often hear so much about in Stoicism. And so what you're going to hear today is the first part of our conversation. Uh, it goes for you know roughly half an hour to 40 minutes. But if you do want to hear the rest of the conversation, I did have some of my Patreon supporters there who asked questions, and we ended up talking for about an hour uh, further after the first initial conversation. Uh, conversation between myself and Kai and Leo. So if you do want to get the rest of that, man, we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, We went on multiple interesting tangents, uh, but just did a little bit of a deeper dive into everything that we discuss uh, at the start of this episode. So I hope that you enjoy this part. uh, But if you do want to get the entire episode, if you want to get the entire conversation, including with the questions from my other Patreon supporters, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. uh, And I've posted it on there as of today. Uh, Now, if you do want to join Patreon and come along to these meetings in the future, we're doing them every two weeks now until I believe the end of October. So there's plenty more for you to come along to. We're talking about everything from uh, the unity of virtues. We're talking about the stoic conception of God eventually, stoic ethics, stoic physics. We're going through so much in the next few weeks. Uh, So you can book those by going to Simon J. E. Drew dot com forward slash Patreon. Uh, That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if you go there, you'll see the schedule of all the topics that we're going to be discussing in the coming weeks. And you can actually book in to come along. As long as you are a Patreon supporter, it doesn't matter if you're paying $3 a month or $50 a month, whatever you're paying, you can come along and join in and ask questions uh, of these two very, very wise individuals who are being very generous with their time. So, Anyway, as I said, please enjoy this conversation with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos, authors of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Okay, so everybody, welcome to our very first deep dive into Stoicism with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos. Very excited to have you guys here, and uh, and thanks uh, to everybody who has showed up as well. We're excited to dive into this conversation. So we're starting today with uh, the dichotomy of control, uh, the, the the great big principle from Epictetus. Now, um, obviously, Kai and Leo have um, their own challenges with this idea, and I have uh, also kind of had varying views of this idea throughout my whole uh path through Stoicism, you might say. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll read the quote from Epictetus first, uh, and then we can have some grounding there. And then uh, I'll, I'll throw it over to uh, Kai and Leo to uh, give their opinions and maybe take me through this idea. So he says the following, and this is from Sharon LaBelle's The Art of Living, a beautiful translation. Happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within our control and some things are not. It is only after you have faced up to this fundamental rule and learned to distinguish between what you can and can't control that inner tranquility and outer effectiveness become possible. Within our control are our own opinions, aspirations, desires, and the things that repel us. These areas are quite rightly our concern because they are directly subject to our influence. We always have a choice about the contents and character of our inner lives. Outside our control, however, are such things as what kind of body we have, whether we are born into wealth or strike it rich, how we are regarded by others and our status in society. We must remember that those things are externals and are therefore not our concern. Trying to control or change what we really 
sorry, what we can't only results in torment. Remember, the things within our power are naturally at our disposal, free from any restraint or hindrance. But those things outside our power are weak, dependent, or determined by the whims and actions of others. Cool. I'll stop there. So obviously, guys, uh, we know, oh, I'll just let um, Walter back in. Uh, we, we know that the kind of Silicon Valley, perhaps um, a business version of Stoicism, uh, my opinion is that they can kind of take this idea and turn it into, um, sometimes I feel like it's it's just used as another tool to get exactly what people have always wanted to get, you know, like you know, how can we use this to increase our fortune? How can we use this to, to um, you know, uh, in, in, improve the company structure, you know, how people think about their work and stuff like that. Fine. You know, great. Um, then we also have uh, the, the various opinions that we've seen um, of this principle saying, well, perhaps it's actually a trichotomy of control. Some things are in our control, some things are not. And then there's that stuff in between, which is appropriate in some senses. But then uh, I think for me, what really changed my idea about this um, principle was, was talking to Dirk Marling, where he reminded me that Epictetus probably was wise enough to recognize if this was the principle that he was talking about, that there were some things that were kind of shady in between. And so it actually means something completely different, meaning like he says here, you know, you've got to bring it right back to that central point within you that you can actually control. That's it. Everything outside of that, uh, similar to something I read from Seneca this week, he, he talks about how, you know, you focus on that part that is, that is uh, yours to focus on um, as in, uh, you know, obtaining wisdom within yourself and you leave everything else to the gods in that ultimately it's not up to you. Ultimately those things are going to play out how they will. But if you, the actor within the world can change your actions from within thus without, um, then that's the thing that's ultimately going to change everything for you. Um, similar to what the mystics would say, you know, it's like if your inner world is different, the outer world will present itself differently to you. And I, I think I've certainly experienced that. But I want to throw it over to you guys. How would you start to talk about this idea? Leo, do you want to go first? Or do you, or would you prefer me to say it? Yeah, and I'll, you I'm sure, I'll follow you, Kai. Okay, so I, with, I do like that translation actually. We just mentioned it in a piece we wrote and was published yesterday. So we're not saying, suggesting that there's no place for such translations. And I think it's a very um, simple and excellent uh, translation of the discourses for somebody who's very new or someone who's quite young. Mm. Uh, but I, I draw the line because I say, okay, this is how we can understand it in English. And this gives us some insight. This is not exactly what we, what the Stoics were saying. So although we may gain a little bit of insight in the beginning, we actually lose a lot of insight when, as we progress in our Stoic journey. And that's one of my concerns that we, we have books of like 200 pages dedicated to the dichotomy of control. So yes, it, it is true that we should know what uh, is in our power and is and what is not right but I don't think that's a particularly stoic idea I think is actually a lot of common sense like mm. that that could that that piece should, of, of advice should apply to anybody like know mm. know what's in your control and what's not and you're going to live a happier life because you're not going to try to change things uh, that you can't change and you're not and you're going to set the wings the way things are when it needs to be the case and then you're going to work out what you can change that's serenity prayer so mm. it's not particularly stoic that, that concept, and yet we sell it as if that's like the key stoic message. I prefer in, um, I prefer like a translation, if I had to put it into Spanish, you'd say, que me corresponde. So what corresponds to me? What belongs to me? And that mm. is dependent on your role, right? So you, instead of saying what's up to my control, you say what, what, what is appropriate for me to do based on who I am and what belongs to me in that instance? Right. So, for example, if you're a drunk driver, the car is not in your control and yet you're still driving it. So if you say, well, is that what's in my control? The car is literally not in your control. So you don't actually get any bonus from there because you're still going down the street as a, as a drunk driver with no control whatsoever. But by a legal definition, actually the physical definition, 
it's actually more interesting to say, is it appropriate for me to be driving drunk? Does, mm. does it correspond to me as a road user to be sober, regardless of the law, actually? And the mm. answer is pretty much yes, you know, like you shouldn't be drunk. So I find that by contextualizing it as what corresponds to us or what is up to us, what belongs to us, to use what you said, Rosinica, I actually think it opens up and we no longer use it as excuses like, well, I can't do anything about climate breakdown because it's not completely in my control. Well, no, it's not. But what, what, what part of that problem corresponds to you? What part of that problem belongs to you? Given that you're supposed to be, you know, pro-social, you are concerned about those in your circles, which we've argued quite extensively that it should also include earth and animals and plants. So I'm not saying, well, obviously the earth, the earth per se is completely out of my control, right? So it's the framing that's off. That's that's my issue. The framing is completely, it's almost anti-social because you say, well, that's got nothing to do with me, therefore I won't do anything. And I think it's very strange when we use that concept as if it were a good thing, when it actually diminishes agency. We typically use it in the contemporary mm. sense to diminish our agency. I'm like, stoicism was the opposite. It was to expand our agency. That's what that concept does. Even if you use control, because you say, okay, now that I know what's in my control, control, now what can I do? And that shouldn't, no, but we haven't used it that way. And we say, oh, well, I feel, you know, I feel a kind of sense of tranquility. And there are contemporary Stoic writers who will say, well, you feel tranquil when you realize it's in your control. That's an Epicurean argument. Why, why should I value being feeling tranquil? I don't know, Leo, mm. if you if you follow my drift or what you'd like sure. to add there. Uh, I, um, I like what you said about, like, it expands, right, your, your area of concern. Um, and to kind of mention what, uh, how Simon drew was, how Simon was uh, reading the, um, the quote right like so you you had to you stop the quote and which is good i mean you have to stop somewhere right but in for, for for the rest of the quote like what that what that dichotomy of control we now call it a dichotomy of control like i'm perfectly comfortable saying this is part of the stoic tradition certainly but um it's a gateway right you know how like you know plato had a sign on top of his academy said if you those who do not know geometry don't come in right so to me this is like a stoic gateway this is like okay um first first things first know what's in your control and once you know that's like step one then now you can come into the you can come into the portico you can come into the stoa and now we can do mm -hmm. stoicism right so for me this is like the equivalent of plato's sign because um with the dichotomy of control like kai said it, it, you know it's expansive in the sense that it's because of this that you can find what your social role is. And this is what the Stoics are saying, right? Once you've learned this, then you can find out, um, you can apply this to your social role. Now, this is complex. And there are some good arguments that make this even more complex. In the sense that for the Stoics, um, part of their epistemology was conceptions and preconceptions. So by the time you get to a certain age, um, you, you find, you, you, you develop these preconceptions what, uh, what they you know what they call like uh, prolepsis right so you you you, call, you develop these and then the problem however is we have this, this this preconception of the good for example which we can all agree on okay we all have a preconception of the good the problem uh the stoics say is in applying this to particular cases where people get confused is in applying this 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 concept if you will to cases of a particular case of what is in fact good and this is where we get mistaken right so if you um if you take things that are not good to be good then or if you take those to where you where where you where you are if you are like with you know your wealth your health your reputation and then you are bound to be frustrated right but if you can put all this in in only what is honorable to be really yours and for this this implies your own uh, prohydesis your own will right your own moral purpose then understanding that that is in your control that opens it up to doing to being a stoic to being moral to being a, a morally healthy person right mm. so um like i still uh, to make to put a point on it i don't want to take the dichotomy of control away from the stoics but um as long as we understand that this is step one i think is so often where hey if it gets people into reading stoics awesome right but it's, it's, mm. it just can't be the last word it's 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 uh the enchiridion part you know one one the, the first part of the enchiridion not the last part right like mm -hmm. we often mention Mm. Okay, well, let me let me jump in with a couple of questions there, then, because uh, Kai, what you the the word that stuck out to me that you used was you know what belongs to me um, is an interesting way of thinking about this, because there is certainly um, 
an element of, you know, in life, there are many things that extend from us. Like you said, the car is, when you hop into a car, it's, it's, it's almost hard to distinguish. Is it you in a car or is, is that one element now where that is an extension of your being, right? Where, you know, there's kind of that symbiotic relationship, you might say. Um, my only, but, but when we, when we make that argument about what is an extension of us or what is, what belongs to us in that sense, I mean, you can very quickly figure out that pretty much everything is <laughs> is an extension of us. Like, every, you know, everything in this room relates to me in some way and is an extension of my, my own being. But, but in that car, my only question is, you know, was it not first the desire to get drunk, the desire to hop in the car, the desire to drive that to a certain place, is that not still, if you pull it back to the ultimate thing that you can control, it's always coming back to what is here, you know, or here. Um, and so uh, to me, it seems like, um, and, and, and bringing it to, to what Leia just said, um, of course, the, the, is, it, is it that you're saying this idea is great, but however, it needs to be paired with this understanding of what is what is right and what is wrong. Like you have to have the dichotomy of control plus a sound philosophical understanding of what is truly good and to be desired, like Epictetus says here, and, and, and what is bad and to be avoided. Is, is that an argument that you guys would make? Well, definitely. And uh, Chris Gill said this this morning, actually said, when we, if, we, if we think wealth is good, then we'll make certain decisions we will mm. make decisions that put us in a trajectory where we obtain wealth, right? Yeah. It's in our, that could be well within our control, the ability to obtain wealth. The, the dichotomy of control doesn't tell me what I should do anything for. Mm. It doesn't tell me any values. So it's, I prefer like what's up to me and what isn't up to me because I think the framing is the pro-social. The framing is the cosmopolis. When I talk, was only about my control. It's very individualistic. And yes, the Stoic philosophy is an individualist, individualistic philosophy, but it's it's a combination. It's always like even like like the pantheism has also got elements. If you look at Epictetus, particularly of a kind of theocratic gods, so there's always that kind of hybrid sort of flavor. If I just talk about in concept of dichotomy of control, I don't get from that, that I should be pro-social, that I should be concerned about other people, that I should be virtuous. It just tells me that I should know what's in my control or not. And if that's dedicated 200 pages to it, then do it in a framing that is a stoic framing because a dichotomy of control by itself, without these key ethical um, claims and value claims, isn't stoicism? I think I'm sure, like Mark Manson, who's pretty anti uh, stoicism, so he doesn't like it, would say the same thing. I'm pretty sure in his very famous two, two famous books, got three now. He does say that no one's up to you, right? So I don't think the stoic can say that's our, you know, that's what makes a difference in stoicism. That's why you should be a, a stoic, because I'm sure that a Buddhist would say the same thing. I'm mm. sure even like the Serenity Prayer, I, I tie it to sort of Christian Christian beliefs, Judo Judeo Christian beliefs. Right, and the Muslims will say Isha Allah, right? So if God willed it, and so I do what I can, but then God willing something else will happen. So I don't see it as a stoic concept per se, unless it's embedded in this sort of the cosmopolis and the framework that the, my body doesn't belong to me in any any sense, actually belongs to the cosmopolis. And so you say, everything is mm. extension of me, yes. But at the same time, my own body doesn't belong to me. It belongs mm. to, it belongs to the cosmopolis and the cosmopolis and then what we have here is what we then have is that logos. So then you say, well, it extends to me. I'm going, yeah, but you're just telling me that we are connected to the logos. That's what you're telling me. Hmm. So it's, I'm not, I don't like that terminology because of the way it can be framed. And it's typically yeah. used to reduce agency and become pretty selfish. Even though selfish isn't it, selfishness doesn't exist in stoicism as a concept. Hmm. It's more like, is it appropriate or is it inappropriate? So I much prefer, does it correspond to me? Is it up to me? Um, and if I have to use, you know, I do say it's out of my, you know, it's in my control or not. We have that caveat. And I haven't mm. seen many books in like chapter one or even chapter seven that would say, hang on a minute, there's a really big caveat here. Because mm. w when I make choices, I expand my agency or diminish it. And the key thing in stoicism is like, what do I want to be able to do? And why mm. do I want to be able to do it? Because if I make decisions to make more money, right? 
and I th- and I, because that's the only good that I value, then I'm st- then then I'm taking my you know myself down a path. And then with yeah. greater money, I can control more things economically because I can say, well, now I have three million dollars instead of three hundred thousand dollars, and now I can control a lot more. Yeah, it doesn't tell me it doesn't tell me anything beyond what I would call a very sort of logical, simplistic argument. Yeah, but I, I, yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying. Hmm. Yeah, and, and and perhaps um, I could throw something else in here. I mean, like I think one thing that I, I guess one thing that I might struggle with with this idea um, is, well, I did an exercise with this once, uh, where it, kind of like the exercise that or that 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 um, Alan Watts describes. You know, he talks about how. We're always looking for our higher self. Where is that point where it's the ultimate me, you know, where I can be the best self? And he says it's kind of like when there's a robber in the first floor of a building and the police come along to catch the robber and the robber is your highest self. And uh, and so, uh, you know, the police go into the first floor. By the time they get there, the robber's in the second floor. And then by the time the police get to the second floor, he's in the third floor. And it keeps on going up and up and up and up, right? Because you can never really catch that part of yourself that is able to, like, like where where does it lie really? Um, and he, do, he makes a great point, which just crushes you if you're listening. He, he says, it turns out that the biggest ego trip is trying to find the ego and, <laughs> and remove it. You know, it's like, that's, that's the biggest ego trip ever. Everybody's trying to do that. Right. Um, but what I took away from that, I did this exercise where I thought about the dichotomy of control and I started trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Where is it? Where's that part of myself that I can ultimately, you know, switch on. And now I'm enlightened. And um, there's a real question there because, I mean, even if we really understood just how much of our lives is governed by our personality, I mean, there's research showing that your personality will likely determine whether you vote left or right. I mean, it's like it's it's that good at predicting how people will behave in their lives. And obviously it's malleable to an extent, but I can't choose to not desire to play music. Like I can't even if I try to force myself to desire something other, you know, ultimately it's still going to be there, right? Can I choose to avoid certain, uh, to avoid desiring or or like to, uh, what is the term? Can I choose to be adverse to certain career types that are just not within my nature, you know? And so, uh, I guess that's a it's it's more of a question that I would throw over to you guys. How do you think about that in relation to even in matters of the soul, there is so much that is apart from our control. And it seems to me like it's more matter. I, I I follow much more the idea of living in agreement with nature, meaning you are not something to assert control over or to uh to to gu- you are something to be guided, you are something to be understood and discovered perhaps um and that's how i see philosophies it's a chipping away at your soul trying to discover what is underneath there ultimately um for for you to uh, allow to come forth i don't know i'll throw it over to you there's a lot of thoughts there but maybe maybe you'll pick up on something well the first thing i would say is if you think that you should be adverse to music is that you're making the wrong moral judgment of course uh because you'd be saying oh like it's it's music no it's the way you play music are you playing the trumpet to be the best trumpet player for yourself only? Or are you mm. playing the trumpet to make the orchestra sound good? Mm. Because that's what the stoic would say. So you're, you have to play the role of the trumpet player the best you can. But that isn't just so that you're a selfish individual when you drown out the rest of the orchestra and you, tell what, you elbow everybody out of the way and you push them out of the way. And trumpet say, players no, are the best everybody. example of that, by the way. <laughs> They're <laughs> well, always the, the loudest. Maybe the trombone player, like push it, literally pushing me out of the way. I mean, yeah. are, you, are you going to play it so that you could, you're the only person who can be heard? Or are you going to seek harmony? So yes, you would be repelled, and this is Aristo, you would be repelled by that which is vicious and attracted to that which is virtuous. But I can't Mm. think of any particular industry where you couldn't seek virtue in it, right? Because if that was Mm. the case, you'd say, well, actually, um, the four vices plus being an accountant is also is the fifth vice, right? Because there's nothing that you'd find attractive in, in being an accountant. So I would say that you might say, I am unlikely to prefer to be a, you know, a hedge fund manager 
because mm. in this current political climate, it means this. And I see a lot of injustice and I just don't find, you know, anything that would draw me to that. But I Stoke would say, yeah, but you can be a just hedge fund manager. No one's mm. saying that you that you can't be because it's within your control, right? To do that, you have, but the Stoke also say that if you have proclivity towards something, then then you then of course you should pursue music. If music is your love, then play it, but play it for play it for the cosmopolis. So mm. I, I think, it, yeah, I would first, and I, you were playing like devil's advocate, I know. So you'd say, of course, mm. if you think that music is bad, and therefore I should prevent myself from playing music. You might say, well, yeah, you're probably going to live a particularly miserable life because you've misunderstood what's bad. Mm, <laughs> so you've, yeah, you've struggled yeah. with something that you didn't need to struggle with. I don't know, Leo, yeah. did I make sense? Right. So um, from what I gather from, from the themes, the themes I'm picking up here is that there's th there, I see three themes and they're all interrelated, right? So um, one of these that I saw is it's impossible for the ancients, and I think for us, if we're reading Stoics, the Stoics correctly, to separate the dichotomy of control from their pantheism, right? Um, at the very least, the pantheism, if not their divine providence. Uh, and, you know, I think the ancients would have argued that you cannot separate from divine providence, but I'll, we can just, let's take it at the lowest level possible and just say the, uh, the, their pantheism. Can I just jump in quickly? Just, yes. can we just, uh, just for, for everybody at home and also just to remind me, can we define pantheism? What does that mean about the Stoics and also perhaps even Cosmopolis, you know, because people might not be uh, particularly familiar with that idea. So I'll throw it over to you. Oh, okay. I get all the, um, the hard ones, huh? Yeah. Okay, I see how this, how this is going. <laughs> so you're by definition, man. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take one, you know, let's take a, a running definition of um, pantheism to state that for the Stoics, um, their, phys their physics or their metaphysics was the matter, the stuff that actually, you know, exists, right? Uh, the bodies that exist in the world but also the order and the rationality that is imminent in those things and in their connection to each other. So if you think of like a molecule, yes, you have the matter, the actual physical stuff, but you have their arrangement and the stuff that, um, or I, I say this, 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 um, this dynamic thing that is going through them, making them the way they are, right? For, for me personally, right, as a, an international relations guy, for me, it's like this concept of anarchy in international, in the international world. You have states and the, the the structure of that system right is going to is going to be in in our in our world now is uh, anarchical right so basically no one's in charge and that puts a bunch of um um you know it's going to put behavior or behavior that should be followed if the state wants to survive and thrive onto these onto these objects now what does that mean can i subtract the anarchy from the the, the states only conceptually and what the Stoics are saying is, yes, you can subtract God from the, the world, but only conceptually. What the world is, is the stuff and the order that's imminent in through, through that stuff. So that's my mm. way of seeing it. But the Stoics would, for the Stoics, it was the stuff and the logos, which is the mm. inherent rationality into the system. So when I say they're pantheism, um, and now they're, there's 500 years of Stoic history and some, you know, there was different emphasis at different times and some were more religious than, than others when it comes to Stoics, mm. but still you get to the, you get to the, um, you get the sense that there is, that God exists, right? But there's nothing supernatural, right? So when they mean God, it's this order, this rationality that's inherent in the system, inseparable from the, the stuff that's in the world. And sometimes they took that to mean that this logos is the mind of God, whereas the, the matter is the stuff the body mm. of god right yeah. but the, but that's kind of deep in their metaphysics i think it's a bit uh, or uh, um you know for our purposes a running definition of, of pantheism to say that the world is god and as long as we take that kind of broadly and generally i think it can still make sense you know what i mean yeah well it, I, I mean it, yeah it's it, it certainly makes sense to me i mean like it it even reminds me well it's certainly then feeds into Christianity, right? I mean, it's a very similar kind of, uh, you know, way that they look at it as well, but also, um, well, some, uh, also just reminds me of this kind of chaos order theory, you know, this kind of chaotic matter turned into um, order by the the ordering principle of the Logos. I mean, this is this is all standard stuff that flows through so many philosophies. But now, now did you finish what you were going to say? Um, you were saying, the, you were saying the pantheism is, yeah, the dichotomy of control and pantheism. We, 
So can you go back to, you see three underlying themes? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, so no, sorry, just, uh, I just jumped in. But no, of course. <laughs> but to put a point on it, on the, on the it, it, it goes with their cosmopolitanism in the sense that because we are part of the universe, experience itself, itself in a certain way, we have a, uh, what they would call this, this divine spark, right? This, mm. this spark of God that is rationality, right? So by virtue of us being rational, um, we share this bond. And by virtue of us being social creatures, it's not just a, a world full of like rational, like, uh, you know, chess players. No, no, no. Because we are human, we are rational a certain way. And that's a social way. Right. Mm. So um, because of that, we can form a community. Right. So community for the Stoics is a place run by a common law and the universe is run by a common law, the moral law. Therefore, the universe, you know, is a community for the Stoics. Right. Um, so, OK, so that ties in this pantheism ties into the, their concept of natural law, which I, I mentioned. Right. There's a natural law that is this logos that is inherent in the universe. But that also ties into this third theme that I'm noticing from what we're saying, and that is property. Right. And it's weird in a sense how similar in some senses to the Stoics are to John Locke here, or I should say that John Locke is the Stoics. So John Locke is, uh, he's, he's, reading, he's reading the Stoics closely, right? Or at least, you know, the Ciceronian Stoicism. And he has this concept of property. So when we talk about life, liberty, and property, for him, property is very broad. It's anything that is appropriately yours, properly yours, if you will, including your life and liberty, right? Um, and for him, unfortunately, meant your servants and their labor is also part of your property, right? But mm -hmm. let's leave that there. But um, I think that what the similarity here, it, when it would come to property, it's that when I understand this rationality in the cosmos, that I'm a piece of it, and this concept of natural law, then for the Stoics, my what is my property gets weird, and it gets very broad in some sense, because it's not just my mind that is properly mine, and my, you know, that's a fundamental importance of the dichotomy of control, knowing what's really mine and what isn't. But, you know, like, like he picked it to phase in discourse one, if God could have, he, Zeus would have said to look all this other stuff, I'll put it in your control too, but he could not to use the analogy. Right. So hmm. the only thing that's, I, that is in my, that I, that I, you know, is absolutely where I have to find my own good is in my own judgments, beliefs, intentions, uh, that, which is in my control. And yet in another sense that, um, that is very stoical is that everything else in the universe is to some extent my property as well, right? Mm. In, in varying degrees of concern, but the good person, the, the well-tuned person, the well-tempered person brings these circles inward and it, it, which implies an expansion of this self and makes more and more things um, or, or, is, or is able to see more and more things as his or her own property. So someone on the other side of the world is still properly mine, appropriate to me to which I have to take into consideration. Hmm. And that's the part of the dichotomy of control that I find the most beautiful. And that a part that I think gets the least ink, you know what I mean? Hmm. Okay, so I like this idea of kind of bringing those circles in, which obviously it expands when, when it gets back to you ultimately. Um, and I guess uh, the, the only other thing that I wanted to, to throw in there is that I feel like we should have a conversation about whether it is preferable to put such a high focus on rationality. <laughs> I mean, I mean, one one idea that I really like from th that I think that the, the the Christians further developed was this idea of uh, wisdom, Sophia, you know, the feminine wisdom sort of idea, and how important that is, you know. So then it kind of brings the rationality and the body, you know, the mind and the body together. Because I mean, I, I I did hear this idea once um, that uh, rationality is seen by some religions and philosophies as the thing that believes in its own creations, which is why it is often attributed to um, to uh, say the devil or like it, it, think about every single villain character that you can think of. It's like evil genius always, right? Because they're like, uh, you know, rationality is that thing that. Um, you know, is extremely helpful, but then also starts to um, uh, uh, tear away at the foundations of the re reality by by believing in its own creation sort of thing. I, I like that idea. I'd like to discuss that further. And perhaps I'm just throwing a massive curveball in here um, that, that makes no sense. But um, okay, well, I think now might be a good time to bring uh, everybody else in here and, and ask some other questions. So, um, for those who are listening on the podcast, 
Uh, you can get the the rest of this conversation on the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. I'm going to be releasing it on there. But um, awesome, Kai and Leo, this has been so much fun so far. So, Hey, everyone, thank you so much for listening to this conversation. I just want to remind you that you can hear the rest of this conversation. It goes for about an hour more uh, on my Patreon. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. And if you'd like to come along to further meetings in the future, then we have uh, roughly eight more to go, I believe, uh, until the end of October, every two weeks from this week. So very much looking forward to those conversations covering a different topic every time with Kai and Leo. And uh, and so you can book those by going to simonjedrew.com forward slash Patreon. And, uh, and there you can see all of the topics coming up as well. And also, I've chucked a link in the show notes below where you can go and grab Kaya and Leo's newest book called Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Highly recommend that you go grab that one. These guys are absolute powerhouses of stoic wisdom, and I know you're going to love it. So, until next time, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you soon. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.